and it was because P.D. James came, and there was such an enormous overflow at the Scottsdale Library that I asked them to send down a camera and so forth from their studio upstairs. And so we've been doing this forever. Wow. Are you we ready? are live. We are live. Okay. I heard my P.D. James story. Some place, some place we are going to find the video because the deal we made with Phyllis was that we would never show it in her lifetime because she had arrived in a rainstorm and she was wearing a rain bonnet and little oh, booties wow. and she really didn't want to be on television. <laughs> Unlike you in your beautiful pink dress. Well, I thought I'd try. It's publication day for Daisy Darker and, um, oh, thank you. You're my favorite audience ever. <clears throat> Um, I thought there'd be no one here and there's loads of you and you're all happy and smiling, you clap at me, brilliant. Um, yeah, I wanted to make an effort. Um, it's been a long time coming, this book, and also I've spent three years really just in the shed because, as you all know, thanks to the pandemic, none of us could go anywhere for a long time. So I had two books out during the pandemic and the idea of celebrating Publication Day became a Zoom call with my publishers saying, yay, it's out. <laughs> so to have Publication Day here with all of you this feels like a great big party to me I'm, I'm really chuffed to see all your faces and um it means the world actually to be able to celebrate with some readers this year instead of just me and the dog so thank you <laughs> i have further good news one of our staff is a noted baker so halfway through this he will be bringing out cookies <laughs> with a cornish i think flavor just when you think things can't get any better. Amazing. <laughs> there we are. Amazing. So good evening, everyone. We sort of backed into this, but thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you for our virtual audience. As you will gather, this is Alice Feeney here to celebrate the publication of Daisy Darker. Alice and I have done, is it three or four Zoom events? This is number three. Okay. And you can look, if you want to see the earlier ones, you can go to our Facebook page or YouTube and search for the earlier ones. And in fact, you should, because the last one we did, Alice, well, it's your story. You had moved house in. I had just moved house, hadn't I? I think it yes. was four days before um, publication here. And I had just moved to a very old thatched cottage in Devon in the middle of the countryside. And when we bought the house, the estate agent said that even though it was very rural, it's got the fastest internet speed in the whole of the UK. <laughs> And he seemed like an honest chap. And uh, when we moved in, I realised he was telling the truth, but only in one room in the house. Um, and this was not the room that where we had set up to do our live event together. Um, and basically the walls in, in the cottage are really thick. They're like this thick and they're made of cob, which for those who don't know is basically mud and straw. And I don't know if you have, it's a 16th century cottage. So it's all very, very old. And I, I don't know if you have the story here about the um, three little pigs and the wolf. And, you, you know, you should be careful what kind of house you live in. I bought the house with the very thick walls made of mud and straw with really zero internet apart from in one tiny corner. Um, but anyway, we made it work. We did. We did. It was all fine. I think there were some boxes in the background, but uh, we had a great time and it was, we did. it was really fun. So you can see Alice at home should you venture onto our <laughs> Facebook page and see this. So Daisy Darker has a really interesting long origin story and it's Alice's story, so you should tell it. Yes, it was... Um, this book was so difficult to write and it took a very long time, but it's also the book I think I am most proud of. You know when you really, really want to get something right and you work really hard at it for a long time and sometimes that works out and then other times, no matter how hard you work, it, things just aren't quite work, working for you. And I, I spent a long time writing this book in 2018 and I did three drafts. And then I sent my agent quite a melodramatic email. I was on holiday in Wales. It was pouring with rain. We'd booked an Airbnb, which looked brilliant online, but in real life stank of damp. And I think people must have died there. Um, <laughs> and I was feeling very sad because I felt like I hadn't written the book the best way possible. So I, I emailed my agent to say, I can't send you the book. I promised to send you the book. I feel terrible. I can't send you the book. I can't send you the book and I'm very superstitious when I write. I don't tell anyone the title, I don't tell them what I'm writing about, so nobody knew anything about it. And he said, what about deadlines? We've got publishers, people are expecting the next book. Um, and I said, don't worry, I've got another idea in my head. I know the next characters so well, I can write it in three months. And I did, I wrote a book called His and Hers um, in three months. I didn't really leave the house or um, have any social life whatsoever. 
but I wrote and I wrote and I submitted the book and um, thankfully few my publishers and my agents said we, we love this book you should be scared that your career is over more often um, <laughs> uh, and so his and hers was published and I came back to Daisy and something was still wrong and it sounds crazy but I didn't know what so then I wrote a book called Rock Paper Scissors um, uh, which was a joy to write actually I quite enjoyed writing that one that that was a more well-behaved book um, five five out of five for behaving well for that book um, but then I came back to Daisy and this time I could see what was wrong with the book but I had no idea how to fix it um, and so I persevered and persevered and then I had another go which involved me deleting 80,000 words um, which for those of you who might not be sure how long my books are they're normally about 85,000 words. <laughs> so I wasn't left with much, um, but I wrote the book again, basically. Same characters, same setting, same story. And this reason, I guess it was the right time for the book because it all just seemed to come together. And I was brave enough to hit send and let my um, agents and publishers read it. And here we are. So five years from the having the idea um, to publication day. With all of you, I keep it's publication day, um, so it's been a long old journey. Um, but I'm I'm just so proud of this book, and I'm I'm just really pleased it's finally out in the world. Well, I'm pleased it's out in the world too, and I'm only sad that we can't really talk about it because you'd kill us because we would completely ruin how it works out. But when you read it, when you're done, I think you'll be able to sympathize with Alice and why it took her. Have any of you read it? Okay, no spoilers, right? <laughs> but you, you understand what the problem would have been, right? Okay, right. Um, that's amazing. That many of you have already read it. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Very impressive since it's just like just appeared. Well, that's, so um, the setting, there have been, and I, I keep wondering if it's part of COVID or what, but there have been an, an, a surprising number of books set on islands set mm -hmm. offshore, set in isolated things. And it's really brought Agatha Christie back. And Agatha Christie, in fact, and then there were none, was a partial inspiration here for you. But you know, what, you did this before COVID. So what, what got you to go to off the coast or the coast rather, in a, in a situation where you weren't on an island, but the way the tide works, it yeah. effectively is an island part of the time. And I just read Anne Cleves' new book, I'm talking to her tomorrow, The Rising Tide, and it's set on Lindisfarne. And there's the same thing, there's a causeway that you can only go over, it's like Mont Saint-Michel, when the tide is out, you can crawl over, when the tide's in, you drown. Uh, but that's an artificial causeway. So mm -hmm. why don't you describe to us the coast of Cornwall, oh, after I lost my thread, <laughs> after you tell us why you decided to pick it in the first place. Um, well, I've been visiting the same secluded spot in Cornwall on my birthday, which is in October, like Nana, for those of you who've, who've read it um, already. Um, and basically every time I go to this little bay, um, I pictured sea glass, which is this crumbling Cornish mansion on this tiny tidal island just off the coast. And in my imagination, it has this turquoise roof, it has tiny bits of sea glass in the walls, it's surrounded by rocks and crashing waves, and I used to always imagine the darker family inside. So it's not a real place, but every year on my birthday, I would visit the same secluded spot and picture them all there and almost hear them arguing with each other in the background. Um, so it came from that, but also I am an Agatha Christie fan. Um, and then, then when I was is one of my favorite books, I have several different copies of it with different jackets. And I was lucky enough to visit Burr Island where Agatha Christie wrote the book, which is just like that. It's a tiny tidal island where at certain times of the day, the sea comes in and you can't cross to the mainland anymore. And in, in real life, Burr Island, um, where she wrote the book, it's very cute. There's a big old Art Deco hotel where I imagine Agatha going for, Chris, for for cocktails and perhaps having a dance in the ballroom. And then there's a tiny little beach hut just hidden away, which is where she used to go just to write. And I was lucky to spend a night in there. And you can, you can imagine her sitting there. And although they've redecorated now, and I'm sure the desk isn't the same desk and the typewriter probably isn't the same typewriter, the view is the view. 
that's the view she would have been staring at when she came up with all these amazing ideas. So I think it was a mixture of different things that made my dark imagination just think, what if, what if when you were cut off from the mainland, something like this were to happen? I particularly like the wheelbarrow. Did you all like those who read it? I love the wheelbarrow because that's the way you could move luggage if you were going to cross over <laughs> this little um, sort of isthmus to the island. Um, I thought that was so British. <laughs> <That's> just, <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. No, I loved it. It was a great touch. So you imagine sea glass. Um, this, who would have built a place like that on an island like that? Did you have to think about that? I mean, well, they built this Art Deco hotel where Agatha Christie used to go. Yeah. I, I guess they must have. Um, well, actually, you've made. I've never thought of it before. But the only way to access that hotel um, is a sea tractor. There's only one of them. It's another British invention, a bit like the wheelbarrow, and it's a huge tractor with giant wheels, which even when the tide is in, when you visit yeah. the hotel, you, you ride on top with your luggage. So I imagine they must have done something very clever and very dedicated and probably quite slow to get all the building materials across. Yeah. Boats, of course, I'm sure as well. I think if you want to do something, you can always find a way. I'm sure you can find a way. It's just I'm trying to envision a person who would actually want to do that. Um, I mean, would it be a basic recluse? Would it be somebody trying to go off the grid? Would it be somebody with so much money they couldn't figure out how to spend it? If I could afford to build sea glass, I totally would. You would? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, maybe the book will do so well. You will fall into that category. That would be great. So once you've got this wonderful home, house, large house, and on this particularly isolated setting, how did you come up with the people that lived there? Oh, the darker family. Well, Daisy, I started with Daisy. I, I knew who Daisy was and I knew that she was born with a broken heart, which um, is the first thing she'll tell you about herself in, in the book. And then the rest of the family just drifted in, really. I knew about uh, Nancy and Frank, who are Daisy's parents. I knew that I, I, I was in a, another Airbnb, but a good one, no damp, no dead bodies in this one. And I found a very old secondhand book called The Observer's Book of Wild Flowers. And I remember picking it up. You know, there's obviously new books, brilliant, because we're in a bookshop. But you know, secondhand books, the old ones, you just pick them up, you can breathe in that scent and imagine all that history and story and just think, who's read this before me? And when I picked this particular tiny green book up that was so old it was falling apart, I just remember thinking, Nancy, Nancy has this book. And I opened it up and I thought, this is how she chose her daughter's names. She wanted to give them all the names of flowers. Um, and so the other sisters came from that, Lily and Rose, who I know people aren't going to maybe like very much. Um, and I always worry with this book that people are going to think that because the darker family are a little bit dark, that perhaps I have very unpleasant sisters or don't get on very well with my own siblings. But the truth is I'm an only child, so um, <laughs> so it's all good. There's not gonna be any big family fallout because I wrote Daisy Darker. <laughs> so tell us about, you know, because in, in sort of classic Agatha Christie, there's usually an elderly person who is either about to make a will or about to make an unsuitable fourth marriage and calls in all of his heirs to witness one or the other, which is like a suicide, you know? I mean, it really is, you know? It's sort of like holding up your hand and saying, come get me. So who is the older person with something to give in this book? So Nana was my favorite character. Um, Beatrice Darker is a children's author, and she is so quirky. And throughout the book, she kept coming out with these, I thought, brilliant little nuggets of wisdom. And I would think, gosh, she's so clever. I like what she's saying in this. And I think, well, hang on, she's not real. It was my idea. It felt like this sort of <laughs> tug of war. Um, and sometimes Nano in the book would just do whatever she wanted to do. And I hate that when the characters misbehave, but I love everything about her. I love that she lives in this crazy house with a hallway full of clocks because she wants everyone to know that her time is her own. So she buys a clock every year on her birthday. So there are 80 of them all ticking away. I did an event in the UK two weeks ago that was not unlike this, where just as I was telling this part of the story, a grandfather clock behind me started going off and I was really quite scared and sort of ran from the room um, and, and flew over here instead. Much better. I can't hear any clocks. Um, but she has a big dog called Poppins and um, she's 
eccentric is probably the right word to use for her but I adored writing her and I miss her actually when I finished the book I, I missed spending time with Nana. I like Nana a lot too. Now if you were a person who wanted to live in a mansion on a tidal island cut away from the world and you didn't actually hadn't inherited billions or something what would be your profession? What would be your profession? It would be a writer, yeah. right? Because yeah. writers can work anywhere. And Nana made a lot of money, right? A lot of money. A lot of money. Without even meaning to make a lot of money. True. Yeah. But nonetheless, yeah. you know, you I, did you draw from your own life here to give Nana a writing career? I don't think I've made as much money as Nana <laughs> yet. I'm trying. I'm trying really hard. Um, yeah, I think so. I think um, certainly when I'm writing, I do tend to disappear from the world. Like with his and hers, where I disappeared for three months, I tend to just like to be alone with the book for a little a little while. And I think a lot of authors are like that. We mm. spend most of the year at home. With um, imaginary with friends. With imaginary friends. Right. We spend more time hanging out with our characters than anyone we know in real life. And then for two weeks of the year, our publishers make us come out and, uh, and have fun and see people again. And there are bright colours and smiley faces. And uh, so it's, it's that strange contrast. So I suppose when I'm writing, I'm quite isolated and I think some some of that definitely probably came across in in the book well I thought I thought Nana felt very real um I'm trying to remember because it's been a little while since I read it but their drives their illustrations are part or key part of Nana's books right yeah. yes yeah so she's also an artist or did somebody I'm trying to remember I'm sorry I can't yeah no she's a children's author and she started off by um just illustrating other people's books That's right. Right. And then she had a bit of a falling out with an author one day and um, without giving too much about the story away, there was a reason why she wanted to make some money and needed to make some money for her family. And because the other author was so rude to her, not that I've met any rude authors, I so have, um, <laughs> she decided to just have a go at doing something her right. own way. And so she did. So she wrote her own children's books and she illustrated themself, um, them herself. And she was actually very good at it. And yeah, there's a there's a line about do you know Quentin Blake here who illustrated all the um, Roald Dahl Roald Dahl books um, years ago. There's a line about um, how the newspapers described her as the female Quentin Blake, and so Nana, being Nana, was infuriated by that and said that they should describe him um, as the male Beatrice Darker. So she's that kind of woman. You get the idea. She um she knows what's what. She's very opinionated, and she's quite certain that her opinions are the right ones. Children's books tend to rise and fall in the illustrations, I think. We have a whole wall of them right over there, and when, you know, when I'm looking at new children's books to buy from the store, I really, I, I, I don't read the story, I look at the illustrations, because I think children relate to the, the drawings and yeah. the books and so forth much more than they're ever going to, to the printed text. So I really like that about Beatrice, that you know, she decided to, and turned out to be very successful. Yes. I don't know how many writers actually also have a drawing skill. Uh, I definitely don't. <laughs> um, for, for those of you who had a glimpse already, there are some uh, dra drawings within the book. So there's a floor plan when you when you start Daisy Darker, which is a bit like um, Cluedo or Clue, as you call it here. Right. Um, and I remember handing in my manuscript. And remember how scared I was after the five years it took to write it and I'd drawn out a floor plan myself just like this um, and I'd also drawn waves at the top of each of the chapters. There are some things to do with um, Scrabble in the book so I'd done little sketches of Scrabble letters and um, waves. It, there we are, lovely. Very nice. um, and because it's a thriller I didn't really think my publishers would let me have this in my book but I've got the best publishers in the known universe and they said yes except they said we'll get a proper artist to draw them. Um, I don't know what they meant by that, but uh, <laughs> but that's what they did and they're beautiful and I'm so chuffed to bits because it, it looks exactly how it w would have looked in, in my slightly bonkers head. So um, it's, I'm really pleased with it. So this book happened to fall over, open rather, <clears throat> on page 143 just now. And it reminds me also that one of the things you do, which I really liked, um, is there's um, some literary composition in it, and you can see where lines are struck out, um, mm. you know, so you can see how the author's mind is working. Um, and I, I like that because, it, you know, it's easy to assume 
when you're reading a book that this was how it always was. You don't really see all the drafts and all the corrections and emendations and everything that go behind it. So I really like the way that you, um, you know, illustrated Thank you. that. Which reminds me that um, it's so rare that anyone can actually do a complete first draft. And this is one of the reasons that I particularly like Mozart. If any of you have ever looked at Mozart's scores, they have a wonderful collection at the Morgan Library in New York. They're, they're all first draft. He wrote it, it was in his head, he wrote it down, and that was the end of it. If you look at other publishers' um, compositions and so forth, you know there are all kinds of edits and notes struck out and all the rest of it, not Mozart. And yeah, we don't have much in common. Clearly, <laughs> it was clearly, um, you know, somewhere on the spectrum. But nonetheless, you know, he's the only composer that I've ever heard of who was able to do that. And, and there may be authors who can do the same thing, but mm -hmm. I think they're fairly rare that the first draft is so perfect that nobody ever touches it. If there are, I'm very jealous, very mm -hmm. jealous indeed. But um, most of the authors I've, I've met do do multiple drafts, although I do know a lot who will share their first draft with their agents. And I have a rule about it's always draft three. Nobody gets to see anything until draft three. I don't really know why that is. It's a rule I made up early on and I've kind of stuck with it. <laughs> I, have a, I saw a photo of you curled up on a on a sofa with your laptop yeah. and doors behind glass doors behind you and so forth. Is yes. that how you compose you? That was in Cornwall. It was. That's actually the so the the sea that you can see behind the bay there. That is where Daisy is set in my head. So that was that would have been a birthday trip, um, one of many where I thought, how do I fix this book? Um, but yes, that's my favorite spot. Next time you're here, we're going to talk about why it didn't work and how you fixed it. Okay. <laughs> Which we can't do tonight. It would be so interesting to to figure it out. So let's see. There's there's the grandmother. There's the fabulous dog. Really love the dog. And thank you for not killing the dog because that is a key thing about, you know, all writers are advised, never kill the dog, right? Cats can go, squirrels, okay. Even children, but no dogs. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, so um, Beatrice and the dog and Daisy, and then she has two sisters. Yes. One is who, Lily, one is Rose. Mm -hmm. But there's more to this family. So who are the other players? Yes, we've got Nancy, um, who is uh, Daisy's mum, and she is a failed actress, is how she would describe herself. But the truth is she never really got into acting in the first place. And I feel really sorry for Nancy because she's a mother who I think people will misunderstand. And it isn't that she doesn't love her children, it's that she just doesn't know how to express it. And I think we've, we've all met people like that um, who just aren't very good at expressing their emotions, but it doesn't mean they don't actually feel something. And I think um, the rest of her family aren't really aware of that but as an, an outsider which is how i felt watching this this family implode um which i'm pleased about i'm glad i don't know them in real life um no. i i felt very sorry for her throughout the book and there was a a scene which always made me cry actually even though i wrote it um at the end where there's a locket that nancy always wears around her neck and it's one of those lockets where there's space for two pictures. And so Daisy always thinks that the two pictures must be of her sisters because she thinks that she is her mother's least favorite child. But in the end, we find out that it, it isn't the sisters. It's just one picture of Daisy and a little dried uh, Daisy flower itself. And I always make, even now it makes me feel so sad because sometimes we don't know how people really feel about us or even how we really feel about other people until it's too late. Um, and this book is a lot about that and how we shouldn't leave things too late. Mm -hmm. We should remember to tell the people that we love that we love them. So there are those three girls, but then there's a boy who manages oh, to come across the yes, causeway. Right? There's always a family friend, I think. There's always someone when you're growing up who is just sort of part of the family, you know? They're not really a blood relative, but they, infiltrate a family in a way that is quite rare. Um, there is a line in the book about how most families are fortresses that few other outsiders get to see inside. And I think that's true. When you think about your own family gatherings, I don't, I don't know about you, but certainly for us at home, we become our younger versions of ourselves. We become like the kids we used to be. We relax and all our guards fall down. And 
we maybe behave a bit more badly because our family know everything about us, the good stuff, or in the darker family's case, the bad stuff. Um, so Connor is kind of a part of this family and joins in and becomes very much someone who they always expect to see at family occasions or birthdays or Christmases. And so he becomes a trusted, extended member of the darker family. And we find out throughout the book whether or not they were right to trust him. So the children are not there all the time. No, it's no. summer, right? It's summer holidays that brings them down to the island. Yeah, and this was um, so this is their nana's home, Sea Glass. So the um, the older daughters are away at school, and Daisy spends a lot of time there because uh, Nancy's one of those mothers who often needs a break from being a mother, um, and yeah, so they're not there all the time. It's these key family moments when they tend to get together. And so we, we, we see this story unfold in the present on Halloween, just to make things even more creepy. Um, but um, the family also have a series of old VHS tapes. Did you ever have home movies and um, you get to watch these things back when you're older and you think, oh my goodness, were we really like that? Um, this is what the family go through. They get to relive some of their memories um, through the past when they were much younger and and see things about themselves that either they forgot or just perhaps chose to misremember. Because I think memories can make liars of us all sometimes. We never all remember things quite the same way. So missing in this so far is the father. Oh, Frank. Right. <laughs> oh, Frank. So Frank, poor Frank. I mean, Frank grew up on sea glass with um, a mother who, let's face it, is quite eccentric. And so he tended to disappear inside his music. There's a piano room and Frank decided that disappearing inside music was much better than having to deal with the real world. So he's gone off and uh, he has a he has an orchestra, which isn't really an orchestra, it's quite a small ensemble, but he, he's made his life about that and he's made his life about work and his work colleagues are probably more like family than his family. So um, Frank is a father figure who is often an absent father but he's come back for this Halloween weekend to see what might be in Nana's will. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right. So amazingly <laughs> enough it is possible to keep secrets even in a very small group like this and what the secrets are we can't tell you. Those who read the book already know. But anyway um, I find that a fascinating part of families too that even though you think that everybody knows all about mm. you and you have all this shared history and all that somehow or other what you think is shared history isn't. It's that, it's that question isn't it? Do we ever really know anybody even the people that we think we know the best? And it scares me when I ask myself that question. I hope so. Um, I hope so but there are definitely people who can become different versions of themselves scarily easily um, and I think we all probably know people like that who can switch things on and off and quickly become a version of themselves that might be a little bit more scary than the, the normal one we are used to. So, um, so yes, we can all keep secrets and this family are definitely pretty good at doing so. Sometimes it isn't secret. Sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, you think, you know, you, you think you remember something and then you discover it later because you were a child. Maybe you didn't really see the whole picture. As you, as you get older, that can really happen to you. My brother and I are, are the only we, our parents are now gone, and so we have become the repository of the family history up to that right. point. And now my daughters are almost 60, so, you know, they're going to be moving along and so forth. And, and I think, you know, my reality of the family is different than theirs. And it isn't so much keeping secrets as that maybe we just didn't share enough, or there were bits of information that my brother, who's seven and a half years younger, remembers differently than I do. It wasn't, you know, any kind of secret and all, but yeah. sometimes we approach something and I realize that we have an entirely different history about what happened there. I mean, even tonight, I find it fascinating that we're all here together. We're all actually having the same experience together, but we will all remember this slightly differently. When you guys go home and tell your friends or family, when I go back to the hotel later on, we'll have a slightly different version of what happened here tonight and how we remember it. And that crazy British author with the pink dress, bonkers. Um, but you, do you know what I mean? So it's, it's really interesting that it's, it's not that any one of us would be lying, 
we just have a different version of the truth. Well, we all filter things through our own emotions and our own experience, which is in part what's going on with Daisy Darker. How did you hit upon Darker as the family name? This is a question that comes up a lot when we have author discussions is how do authors name their characters? Where do they get the name inspiration? So, you know, what, Daisy Darker determined there would be Lily and Rose, I'm guessing, if you wanted to do the botanical thing. Yeah. But where did Darker come from? So Daisy was always Daisy. And um, well, actually, so as you said last year, I just when we spoke when Rock Paper Scissors was published, I just moved house. But um, a bit like this book, it took me years to find the right project. I wanted a very old house with lots of character, and I wanted to love it back to life. And now that I've had the builders in since April, that was a really silly idea. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. But during the several years of house hunting, my husband and I found a house which we didn't buy. Um, on the Cornish coast, um, which was beautiful actually, but <laughs> there was something a bit spooky about the place. And uh, I remember speaking with the estate agent and he said that it had a terrific story behind it because of the owner. And it was owned by someone called Mrs. Darker. And I don't know if any of you know the English patient, the, the book oh. and the film. Um, apparently this Mrs. Darker in the house that we were looking at was the inspiration for the main, main female character in the English patient. And there was this very turbulent love story um, associated with the house, which isn't why I didn't buy it. But it also made me really glad that I had at least had a look at it because I drove home thinking Darker, Darker, Mrs. Darker, what a fabulous name. And then I just thought, because I was writing Daisy, Daisy Darker, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? I mean, that's, just, and it's so funny how these little things happen in life. It's bits for the book come from everywhere. I, I promise you there'll be something here tonight that will work its way into a book. And because I take so long, it won't appear for two years. Um, <laughs> but there's always something. I did a signing two weeks ago um, where a very lovely um, lady came to the, the front of the queue and asked me to write her name in the book. And I just froze because I said, is that your real name? That's yeah. incredible. And she said, yes. And my sister is called and she told me the name. And I said, would you be offended if I used your name and possibly your sister's name <laughs> in a book one day? And she said, oh, no, no. Can I tell my sister now? I'm going to WhatsApp her. I said, okay. Um, but, um, it, it's amazing. I, I know that I will do that. I know that's the kind of thing that goes in somewhere and I will remember it. And I do remember. It. I'm just not going to tell any of you in case... You accidentally tell someone else and they use it in a book. But um, <laughs> it, it is funny. It, it comes from everywhere in life. It's, um, it, it's incredible. Everything that we watch and read and see, it's all going in somewhere and turning into dark and twisty stories. I think if we were all honest, we would have some negative associations with some names, maybe because we didn't like the person. Um, and so, you know, it, it would be difficult to bond to that character in a book. Um, but the other thing you have to be really careful about when you're writing a book is you can't have the names too much alike or you, the reader, kind of get lost. So you can't have like James, Jimmy and John, you know, as like central characters. So Daisy Darker is great because it is distinctive yeah. and, and Lily and Rose. I'm trying to remember the names of some of the characters in your earlier books. What were they called in Rock, mm. Paper, Scissors? So um, somebody asked me recently about that because until Daisy... A very clever reader spotted that my main character's names often begin with the letter A. So in my first ever book, um, Sometimes I Lie, it was about somebody called uh, Amber, Amber Reynolds. And even in Rock, Paper, Scissors, my last book, the, the main female character was called Amelia. Um, and I've had an Anna Andrews. I've had an Amy Sinclair. And the truth is, I don't know why I'm sharing this. Um, <laughs> it must be the heat. Uh, when I, after I published my first book, um, I was lucky enough to go to Germany and see my book um, being published in Germany. And I met my German translator and she had just started reading my second book. And she said, oh, your second book, Amy Sinclair. Do you always name your main characters with the letter A because your name starts with A and secretly they're all you? And given, given I write quite unlikable characters <laughs> and I'd spent the afternoon with her, I wasn't sure how to take this, to be quite honest. But um, the idea of that, which is not true, tickled me so much. I was so amused by it. 
that I did it as a little joke to myself. Um, and I do like names beginning with A. Um, but for this book, I broke my tradition and Daisy was, was always going to be called Daisy. And make of that what you will. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to envision the translator as a psychoanalyst. Uh, <laughs> she's German, maybe it was a Freudian touch or something <laughs> in there. So what are you working on now, now that Daisy's out? Um, because yes. actually for Alice, this book has been done for a long time. And therefore, her head is probably to a great degree in a future book that you will get to read in another year or two. You know me very well. Oh, um, no, that's just how it works <laughs> for all writers. It's, um, yes, the next book is written. Um, and I will be sending it to my publishers and my agents when I get back from the Daisy tour. And I have my publication date already for September next year. So I'm pleased to say the next book will be out in September next Wonderful. year. Wonderful. Yeah. When we might. I have a slightly cool temperature, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not hopeful. At least she missed the monsoons, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They were spectacular. In a way, I'm sorry you didn't see them because they really are amazing weather Next events. Time. But, uh, next time. Right. <laughs> and, but fewer, did we have fewer dust storms? We had more rain and less yeah, dust, if I remember right. A haboob is a really interesting thing to see. You could otherwise go to you know, North Africa, but they rise out of the desert. You see this enormous oh, wow. dust cloud coming at you. Maybe that will be inspiration for some, but it's not very British. <laughs> I'll have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed you could. So, do you have questions that you would like to ask Alice? Anybody? Don't be shy. That's why she's here. Yes. So you're like the queen of writing twists, and I was just of wondering, like, do you start your ideas by like having the twist in your head and building off of it, or do the twists even surprise you? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm definitely a bit of a planner, so I have these crazy boards on the wall behind my desk at home, which, you know when you see those crime TV shows and with all the bits of string, and it looks like that. I worry that if the police ever came over, I'd be in trouble. But it's, it's just me planning the books out. So I always know the big twists, I am, this is book five. I'm super excited about the big twist in book 10. Sometimes I want to change the order of the books because I want to write that one next. But smaller twists do happen during the writing process. And when that does happen, it feels like some kind of crazy magic. You think, oh, could I? Should I? Will they hate it if I do? Oh, let's do it. Let's sneak that one in there. So it's a, it's a mix of the both. But for the big ones, I think I have to know so I can put the clues in there and leave some breadcrumbs because it's I always want to be fair with my readers I want everyone to have a chance to to guess what those twists might be although I prefer it when you don't <laughs> you get the best prize every time job done brilliant thank you <laughs> I'm not at all sure that anyone can truly guess the twist in Daisy Darker I think there are people who um who compare a book to other well-known books and I was briefly tempted, but then no, I recognized that if I did, <laughs> if I put in that book, everybody would know then what the what the twist for Daisy was. Um, but I think I think it's I don't think you were unfair. I don't mean that, but I just think it's hard to imagine what's going to happen. It makes me it makes me so happy with this book when people think they know. Um, my husband is always my first reader, um, which is always terrifying and not great for our marriage. Um, <laughs> but I, he always writes in the notes when he thinks he's guessed it, in red pen, which is quite passive aggressive, I think, but um, little notes down the side saying, now I think it's so-and-so. Uh, oh, no, no, it's definitely so-and-so, but you, you've given it away here. And I think, oh, have I? Have I really? Um, and it, it makes me over the moon when um, he doesn't guess the twists. And I'm very grateful for him being my first reader, which I have to say because he's in the audience tonight. But, um, but no, we, we have a lot of fun with those first read-throughs. Patrick, are there any questions coming in? Or... Yeah, yeah, there are a few questions. Um, you might want to emerge so emerge. people can, right, he's such a sepulchral voice, otherwise it's <laughs> um, like Halloween. Yeah, let's see, There, Robin would like to know, um, are there fellow authors that inspire you, or which fellow author inspires you the most, is what she asked. Oh gosh, so many, so many. Um, Agatha Christie was definitely a big um, inspiration when I was growing up, and I think that shows in this book. Stephen King, I, um, people always ask why are my books so dark and I think it's reading too much Stephen King at a very young age actually and that definitely played a part. 
and more recent authors. I'm a huge fan of Lisa Jewell. I don't know if there are any other Lisa Jewell fans out here. Um, she's got a fantastic new book out this year, which is a follow-up to one the of... The Family of, Remains exactly, is the name of the new one, right, to from the, the Family, family Upstairs. upstairs yeah. which I loved, and I loved The Family Upstairs so much, I was almost scared to read the new one, but it's even better, even better. I thought she did a brilliant job, and yeah. interestingly enough, it's the, because we did this conversation in July, um, Lisa does not like to write sequels. All of her books, except The Family Remains, are standalone books, but there was enough to work with. Yeah. But she did say she wasn't going to do it again. You know, she enjoyed wrapping up that one, but not, and you also prefer to write standalone I books. I do, I do. Everything is going to be a standalone book except for book 10. That's all I'll say. Oh, wow. The magic book 10. <laughs> I love this coming. Right. So you can see, you know, the, the advantages, the disadvantages that you have to build the whole world from scratch for every book if you're the author. But the scary part for you readers is everyone in the book is in jeopardy, right? In a series, you know Jack Reacher is going to make it to the next book, right? <laughs> but in Alice's books, you have no idea who is going to survive. Except for the dog. I mean, spoilers. That's aside. right. Yep. Never worry well, we about the dog. We already mentioned the dog, <laughs> right. We've already done that, right. Another question, Patrick? Uh, yeah, let's see. Michelle would like to know, do you have a favorite character out of all of your books? Daisy. Daisy. Easily Daisy Darker, yes. Yeah. All right, audience. Yes. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. So I'm a really big fan of the quote that good writing is almost never finished, but it's merely surrendered. What are some personal methods you use for determining when to stop, whether it's rewriting, editing, or developing a story? That's a great question. It is a very good question. Thank you. When we're at the printers, I know I'm not allowed to make any more change. Um, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think that is a fascinating question. I've asked many authors that question. How do you know when you can let go? And a lot of the time it's a practical answer because my deadline is here and my editor is on the phone and, you know, I have to let it go. But the thing is, if you want to be a published author, you do have to surrender the book at some point. You can't write it forever. Mm. And, you know, but I think that's a really tough question. You know, when is it good enough? Or do I have to do it now, even if I'm not sure it's good enough? And what will happen if I pull it back to work on it some more? I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of issues involved there. Stephen King um, did a really interesting program this morning that mm -hmm. I, I watched, and I was fascinated. He has a new book com coming out called Fairy Tale mm -hmm. next Tuesday, a uh, week from tonight, actually. And um, a question was asked whether he himself had grown up with fairy tales and all. And he said, yes, his mother read fairy tales to him every night. Um, and because of the mind, the way his mind worked, he always fastened on the really dark stuff, <laughs> the dark side of Rumpelstiltskin, you know, the troll under the bridge, the whole <laughs> bit. Um, but fairy tales can be, in fact, yeah. very dark. They are not all Walt Disney versions at all. So were fairy tales part of your childhood experience? Oh, yes. Um... I still have some of my fairy tale books from childhood. I'm, I'm sure I probably imagined things being even darker than they were, a bit like Stephen King. But there's, there's so much magic in those sort of stories. Um, they're so perfect for young, fertile minds, I think. And how we interpret them, like all things, probably says quite a lot about who we are and the way we feel about the world. If you're old like me, you can remember the yellow book of fairy tales and the red book of fairy tales and all that we're all sitting there on the library shelf and the librarian would look at you trying to decide if you were really old enough, mature enough to take out the blue fairy tale book. <laughs> um, I don't think the colors actually were coded to the stories. I think they were just collections that way. But I read them all and the odds books were really my, my childhood reading. I love them. Patrick, any other questions? Life, huh? Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Yes, sir. So it says under your bio that several of your books are optioned for film. Mm. How much say do you get to prevent them from being? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, I've been really lucky so far that, yes, a few of them have been optioned. And um, I'm pleased to say that uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors is um, 
hurtling forward at full speed for those of you who might have read that book so that's Wonderful. gone to netflix and it's being made by um a lovely woman called suzanne who's the producer of the crown do you have the crown here yeah. i know right so um <laughs> I, I was um I was had a deadline and uh, when I'm when I'm close to deadline I don't do much sleeping I don't do much sleeping at the best of times really but I remember feeling so tired I was probably having three or four hours sleep a night and I came down and I sent off what I needed to send off um, and I looked at my laptop and an email was there from my agent and it just said Netflix and I thought okay and I I opened up the email and this was maybe six months before Rock Paper Scissors was published. And it was at a time where I was feeling quite wobbly and insecure. And also in my uh, inbox was a draft email to my agent saying, maybe we shouldn't publish rock, paper, scissors. That's how scared I was feeling that I had somehow written a bad book that my readers wouldn't like. And I didn't want to let down my readers. And so I thought I must sleep on sending that email because I'm very tired. This other email appears about Netflix and I opened it up and it said, I, just to let you know, the producer of The Crown would really like to uh, make an adaptation of Rock, Paper, Scissors for Netflix. Give me a call, let me know what you think. <laughs> and because I was so tired and was so worried about this book, I thought I'd lost my remaining marbles. I slammed my <laughs> laptop closed and I took my dog for a walk. I was still in my pyjamas. I didn't even care about the neighbours and um, came back. And then I slowly opened up my laptop and the email was still there. <laughs> and it was a real thing. And I hadn't lost the remaining marbles yet. I may have by now, but this was a while ago. And so, no, it's been really brilliant ever since. And we had a Zoom call because that was in COVID times. And we've met up in London and um, I got to have a, a meeting with the whole team a couple of months ago. where We had a casting meeting. I mean, this is the stuff of dreams. There were sheets of paper with possible Amelia's and possible Adam's and... And apparently, for those of you who've read it, there's a there's always a dog in my books. They're always fine. Um, Bob the Labrador. I found out that we're going to need three yeah. black Labradors to play Bob in the show because apparently dog actors have really big rights going on. You know, they need breaks for tummy rubs, walks, biscuits, bones. Um, so, yeah, we've got a couple of episodes. We've got a director attached. We've got some other things I'm not allowed to say or a Netflix fan will appear and I'll be in trouble. Um, but, um, no, it's really, really exciting. And I, I don't think they're going to ruin it. I think it's going to be incredible. It's all going to be set in Scotland, just like the book. The scripts are so true to the book. I just can't wait to see my characters come to life on screen. It really is dream come true stuff. I feel very lucky. Anybody else have a question? Yes. So a lot of girls Actually, Winstead, they write other genres besides thrillers. Mm. Is that ever something you consider or you wanted to do? Is it a process? So I have 10 dark and twisty books um, for adults, although I've got some young readers as well, I, I, I think. Um, someone who was 11 years old sent an email. I, it's quite worrying, isn't it? Um, <laughs> really, really. I know sometimes people, when they make me think I'm a children's author, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> Should be a warning sticker um so no definitely 10 like this and I, I try and always make my books a bit different every year i want them to feel like an alice feeney book but i want to give you a different slightly different journey i'd hate to write a book that felt like something you'd read by me before so um they'll always try and have something a little bit different in there but then after book 10 i just don't know and sometimes when i look back at this book i do think Nana Darker, she's got a pretty good life going on, living in sea glass with the crashing waves. And um, I have a niece who is my biggest fan, um, but she's six. And so she, uh, every year the books come out and she says, can I read it now, Auntie Feeney? No. Uh, so I do have the odd fantasy about writing something that perhaps she could read. That would be nice. Lucy Lighter. No. Not, yeah. <laughs> Quick, write that one down. <laughs> Uh, there's a question here from uh, Rochelle who would like to know, I, th she, I think she's a, a new writer or aspiring writer, and maybe some of you guys are too. Um, do you have any advice for aspiring writers? Oh, yes. Um, 
I was an aspiring writer for a long time. Um, for those of you who don't know, it, it took me 10 years to get published, um, 10 years to get an agent to represent me and to find a publisher. And I was just about to give up. And then I wrote a book called Sometimes I Lie and that changed. So my advice would always be to, um, to, to read a lot to uh, write a lot and to try and write the kind of books that you want to read and most importantly piece of advice number three is never give up because that that's certainly true in my my case and I always think if you never give up at something you can't fail right if we don't give up at it then we're still trying so we haven't failed which is still something we're trying to do so if you don't give up I think one day if you just keep writing you'll, you'll get there Sometimes it takes a really long time, too, before an author does something so iconic. I was thinking, Rex Stout actually wrote 49 books, many of them bad, before he thought about Nero Wolf. Think about that. You know, that's a really... It's a lot. It is. It's, it's a, a lot. You know, so perseverance is a major part of being published. Is you, and you have to keep trying different things until yeah. one thing clicks. Yeah. Were you here for Ashley Winstead? She's really amazing, isn't she? Uh, so... Oh. So you thought, wrote... there's another Ashley Winstead writing these creepy crime novels. Huh? Yeah, she was, she was really great. She was here with Sandra Brown, and it was a really nice program. Again, you can find it on our Facebook. But uh, anything else there, Pantry? No. All right, anybody else have a question in the audience? Hasn't it been great to meet Alice? It's really been wonderful. We have now come to the part of the program that I always enjoy, which is that I'm going to give away a free book. For those of you who bought a book, you should have numbers in your books. We did do numbers, Larry, didn't we? 25, great. And also, I see the cookie cart back there. So you can venture to that before you come up here. Um, and we do ask you to line up by number after we are through here. So Alice, your job is to pick a number between one and 25. And this is a new book by Catherine St. John called The Vicious Circle. She earlier wrote two very interesting books. From this I learned, do you all know the word boogie? Boogie lifestyle? B-O-U-G-I-E? Bougie. See? I didn't even know that. Okay. Proving I am so out of it. Anyway, she wrote The Lion's Den and The Siren, and I thought those were great examples of the bougie. Thank you. Bougie lifestyle. Why is that spelled with a J? <laughs> anyway, um, the vicious circle is kind of similar. Uh, it involves a Russian model called Svetla, who is engaged to a very snooty New York. This is a book where class, which hardly ever figures into American novels, but actually class is key here. And she has an uncle that is running a wellness operation in Mexico. And mysteriously, he dies. And mysteriously, she inherits it. And off we go. So it's very good. So what number would you like? I think it has to be number 13, which I think is lucky. <laughs> Ooh. Right. You have to look in your book. And if number 13 isn't here, we'll move on to a different number. Oh, oh it's you. <laughs> isn't that great? Thank you. Thank you. I Enjoy said it's lucky for you. <laughs> it doesn't publish till for another week or two. So, um, so it's great. I'm glad we could give that away. Um, thank you, Alice. Thank you. Yay.